Thanks, Jerry, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, let's jump into it. Well, like everybody else, I've got a disclaimer of my presentation, a little bit different uh, to the other ones, I guess, in so much that I need to point out that even though I am on JORC, what I'm talking about today are my opinions and not the official word of the JORC committee. Um, let's uh, start with a quick history lesson, shall we, uh, on, on uh, mining disclosure through the ages. So we go back 460 years. You might have heard of a book by a fellow called George Bauer, perhaps better known as Agricola, who 460 years ago wrote a textbook on mining and felt it uh, important that he include in his textbook some commentary about uh, doing your due diligence before you buy shares. Obviously, there's a few shonks around in Germany uh, 500 years ago. Um, in the years after George Bauer, the public perception of miners didn't necessarily improve a lot. Uh, you've probably seen this quote. Uh, it's been bandied around a lot. Uh, it's commonly attributed to Mark Twain, probably because he was a gold prospector in California, but it was being used commonly uh, well before uh, Mark was born. But it tends to suggest that there was not a lot of uh, confidence in the mining sector back in the day. So let's jump forward to 1969 here in Australia. That's when we had the Poseidon boom. Um, whilst I was around then, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to the mining sector, but uh, talking to various people around the audience, I know that there were people who were here and uh, are well aware of uh, things that happened during the Poseidon boom. So uh, just a, a quick recap to refresh your memories. You know, there, there was a small explorer called Poseidon and they had a project out at Windamara. And that was coupled with a global shortage of nickel. So the nickel price was going through the roof. So that exploded into a complete countrywide bubble of mining speculation here in Australia, founded on pretty dodgy assumptions, and every man and his dog was in it. Uh, taxi drivers, school teachers, you name it. I was talking to someone who said that they were at high school. They used to go home and get the paper and check their, their stocks at the end of the day to see how it was going. So Poseidon announced that they drilled some massive nickel sulphides and their share price went from a dollar to $280. And that just precipitated the whole thing. Every man and his dog jumped into it uh, and it seemed like everyone in Australia was investing in mining shares fueled by rumour and misinformation. And then it collapsed. Um, and this, this happened with multiple companies. Another particularly egregious example that you may be aware of was a company called Tasmanex, where completely misleading and grossly optimistic statements were made by the company's chairman and directors about visible sulphides. Didn't tell anyone what the visible sulphides were. Turned out to be pyrite. Um, they got a massive run up in their shares. Uh, then the bubble popped and everyone was left holding nothing. And this happened time and time again. And there was very much a public outcry uh, in Australia about the Poseidon boom. You think the, the, the Banking Royal Commission was a big deal. The Ray report back in the 70s was much bigger and much more influ influential in terms of its outputs uh, compared to uh, what, what's likely to come out of the Haynes Commission, I suspect. So the, the, the federal government asked Senator Ray to set up a committee to, to investigate both the securities industry and the mining sector. And in 1974, they put down, uh, handed down their report, which basically documented a whole series of unethical, inefficient and downright corrupt practices uh, in the mining industry and the securities industry. And that led very directly to some pretty important changes in Australian business uh, practice, in so much as the stock exchanges all got changed around, ASIC, well, the precursor to ASIC, but what turned into ASIC was created, and they wrote the Corporations Act, which is the, the document that controls everything that we're doing in business in Australia these days. And it also led to the creation of the JORC Code. Um, the Ray uh, Committee and the Melbourne Stock Exchange asked the OzIMM and what was the uh, Australian Mining Industry Council back in the day to form the Joint Ore Reserves Committee uh, to write a code to deal with some of the problems that had come out of the uh, Poseidon uh, uh, issues. So that brings us to where we are today. Um, there's a picture of my desk with some of the uh, documents that we've got to deal with uh, when we're writing public reports these days. Uh, it's quite a complicated uh, environment we work in. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, they're the, uh, the arches down at Elizabeth Quay in, in Perth and they're a nice way of capturing how all the different layers of regulation work uh, in the mining industry these days. So overall 
you've got the, 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 the Corporations Act, which dictates everything that we do, and that's driven by ASIC, uh, and their catch cry is all about reasonable basis, and it's their lawyer's definition of reasonable basis that drives things. And if you make any sort of forecast, it needs to have a reasonable basis, otherwise they will deem it to be misleading by default. Um, so how do you prove you've got a reasonable basis? Well, they, they look to the JORP code uh, for that. Corps Act uh, uh, is, is what also governs uh, the ASX. Obviously, ASX runs the market, uh, and that's essentially contracts between companies and, and uh, the ASX uh, to trade their shares. And the JORP code is part of the ASX listing rules, so it's got the full force of law. Um, it's not uh, an, an optional lecture, it's, it's part of the law. And the codes, as you can see down there in the centre of things, they're all about the project uh, and, th and they're the mandatory codes that, that the members of OSIMM and AIG need to follow when they're talking about public reports. So what's a public report? Pretty much well, as you can see, everything's a public report. If you're putting any information out in the public domain to inform investors, it's a public report. Doesn't matter whether it's an ASX release, uh, a Twitter post, uh, a YouTube video, it's all public reports and the regulators expect you to comply with the listing rules uh, and the codes when you do that, even though that can be a bit challenging in 160 characters. Um, so what does the JORP code do? Well, it sets out minimum standards, minimum standards. It's not best practice, uh, it's not the only way to do things, it's the minimum standard for talking about uh, information in the public domain. Very importantly, it provides this classification system uh, that we use to, to talk about tons and grades. So inferred, indicated and measured, proved and probable, these are critical uh, aspects of the code. It also describes who can be a competent person because that's a fundamental part of the code as well and the qualifications and experience that you need to be a competent person. And overall, it provides guidance on how to actually do a report. And there's three principles to the code, as you probably know. You've got to provide material information in a transparent way provided by a competent person. Uh, I guess the heart of the code boils down to this. This is the really clever part of the code. It enables you to distill all the possible complications of any sort of mineral deposit you can think of into a, a system that everyone's fairly familiar with, how to talk about things now. I won't go into that in any great detail because I'm assuming most of us are pretty familiar with uh, how, how figure one works. So what, what are some features and reasons for the success of the code? I say simplicity. Uh, you might not necessarily agree that the JORP code is, is a simple system, but I can assure you if you compare it to the three-dimensional uh, classification system of the uh, UN framework classification, which is this magic Rubik's Cube system that nobody understands, JORP is way simpler than that. It's also way simpler than the excessively prescriptive approaches that the Russians and, and the Chinese take which is basically an encyclopedia for every possible deposit you can think of and you have to follow it to the letter. No flexibility, no allowing for the idiosyncrasies of your deposit, you've got to follow their rules. So, JORP code, simple. It's also non-prescriptive. It doesn't tell competent persons how to do their job. It just tells them how to talk about it in the public domain. So it's mostly guidance. There's a few rules in there, but it's mostly uh, you know, clues and hints for the competent person on how to do their job. And it's very flexible. Um, it can deal with any permutation of geology, mining, uh, processing that you care to come up with. And it's also part of this continually improving world system. The JORP code is one of our most successful exports, I'd say, in terms of public administration. <laughs> it's been picked up all over the world. Canada, China, Kazakhstan, Chile, they all use versions of the JORP code. And every time they issue an update, we make incremental improvements. You, and another key feature of the code is the competent person system. It's not a perfect system, as I'm sure many of you would be aware, but it is uh, the, the one feature of the JORP code that enables it to be flexible. It relies on the expertise of a competent person. So instead of laying down huge lists of rules on how to do things, the competent person is the list of rules. And because they're an expert, they should know how to report things. And if they're not, then they're accountable to their professional body to do a better job. Um, from day one, the JORP code was designed with investors in mind. It was created by industry to be workable for industry, but the regulators and end users were a part of the process from the very start. And that 
is uh, a far superior system than something that's been on, imposed on the industry by lawyers and politicians who really don't understand things. Is it perfect? No, of course not. But it's a damn sight better than any other options out there. And the regulatory backing of the code meant that it actually had some teeth, it got some traction, and it has now become uh, well and truly entrenched in the way we do things uh, in Australia. The talk code doesn't do a few things as well, and it's probably worth just emphasising what the code does not do. It doesn't tell you how to do things. It certainly suggests issues you should consider, uh, and says that if you're not going to talk about something, you've got to say why you're not talking about it. If it's not important, we'll say why it's not important. But it's a reporting code. It's not a, a, a doing code. It's not a recipe for how to do these things. So that's why there's no such thing as a JORC compliant resource. There's only JORC compliant reports. The code doesn't tell you how to do a resource estimate. So I think all that adds up to the fact that the code um, is a bit of a competitive advantage for the mining sector. After the, the fiasco of Poseidon, uh, pretty much well the whole industry uh, embraced the concept of a JORC code, more or less willingly in some cases, but overall the industry has, uh, has embraced the code. Unlike competing sectors, you know, cryptocurrencies or pharmaceuticals or tech stocks or all sorts of complicated things, they don't have any consistent way of talking to investors compared to the way the code works. So you get disclosure of critical information, which you don't always get with other sectors. You get this balanced disclosure so people can understand risks and upside if that's what they want to do. Um, it prov provides consistency and it lets you make comparisons between quite different things. That is really difficult in other sectors because they don't have a JORC code. All of that, I guess, leads to the fact that we've got more efficient capital raising, which helps siphon funds from other sectors. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, I've, you know, the, in, the mining industry has developed a bit of a reputation from time to time for destroying wealth. Uh, and despite some quite spectacular successes we've had, we still see examples of failures. So we need everything we can going for us to, to battle those, uh, those, those negative perceptions. And the JORC code lets us do a better job of communicating with investors. Uh, you know, my personal opinion, I, I don't think uh, that, that complying with the code is that much of an administrative hassle. If you're organised and got your act together, you're going to have all the information at your fingertips anyway. So it's more like pre-match training and coaching for you to help you win the game, help you win the investment. Um, a, a good report um, is, is really uh, a showcase for a company's board and management. So as well as simply just supplying news, a good report does many other things. It reveals your technical skills and helps differentiate your project from your competitors. It's not just about numbers, but it's about opinions and explanations and context uh, to help people understand. It, a, a good report highlights the clarity of purpose of a board. I mean, if they're all over the shop, that comes through in their reporting. Uh, and it, by discussing risks and presenting a balanced, informative narrative, you not only show your integrity, uh, and ethical standards, but you make it easier for investors to appreciate your story. And if you're doing that consistently, then that's a better chance of raising funds than if you're not doing it that way. Um, risks are in the eye of the beholder, and I guess uh, if you've got a good report, that lets people make up their own minds. You don't get somebody else telling you how to assess risks. Uh, so good reports uh, are well worth doing that. I, I don't know whether uh, you, you were aware of it, but a couple of weeks ago, the head of uh, RCF uh, Capital gave a talk in, in New York, uh, and he was talking about in investment opportunities and pointed out that out of 107 uh, mine construction projects they looked at, not one of them had managed to come in on budget. And they were often, uh, the average was 38% over budget. So his comment was, look, if you want investment mining industry, do a better job. So my contention would be that the JORC code lets you do a better job. Uh, it lets you tick off and things and make sure that you haven't forgotten stuff and that you're doing a great job. So, you know, think like an investor when you write a report. So, oops, sorry, went back there one. So, just wrapping up, um, for those of you familiar with uh, Douglas Adams' uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I think the jaw code's a bit like a Babel fish. It lets you understand, it promotes understanding. It's a communications tool. Um, it's an advantage not shared by other uh, sectors looking for funds. It lets you compare apples and oranges and elephants. But it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't turn a bad project into a good one. 
Uh, it's not meant to uh, kill projects, um, and it's, uh, it's just a tool to build investment uh, confidence so people uh, are happy investing in your company. So all about trust. Uh, it lets you help to navigate the rules and, and the professional expectations. It helps you come up with a fit for purpose document. It doesn't have to be 100 pages, it can be two pages as long as it's got the right information in it. And it doesn't tell you how to do your job, it tells you how to talk about the job you've done. Thank you.